Today's guest is Alex Bellos. Alex is an author, journalist, and something of a puzzle guru. He's also been a regular on Numberphile videos over the years, featuring in some of our most popular posts. You may well have seen him cutting cakes, counting cows, and playing pool on an elliptical pool table. We'll get to the books and the puzzles later. But first... So, Alex, where, where were you born? Oxford. Oxford? Yeah. Oh, so you're like a posh person, are you? That made me posh. I don't know. So I was born in Oxford from a Hungarian naturalised French mother and a father who was still a student there whose grandparents were poor immigrants from Ukraine. So they did all right. And I guess now I'm posh in the sense that I then studied at Oxford and I write books. But I don't think then you'd have called them posh. You'd have called them kind of hardworking immigrants. What occupations do they do, your, your parents? So my dad has been an academic all his life. About 20 years ago, got a job at Princeton, where he's head of the Department of Comparative Literature, which is basically modern languages. His speciality is French and now has become translation. So he runs, I think, the Centre for Translation Studies, something like that, at Princeton. He, he is a translator himself, but also the kind of the, the, the science, I suppose, of translation. And there are certain French authors who he is experts on, one being Victor Hugo, the other one being Georges Perec, who writes actually quite kind of mathematical books, and Balzac. So when I was born, I think he was doing his PhD on Balzac. <laughs> oh, right. what about, and did, you, did your mother... So my mum was born in Hungary, then at the final months of the Second World War, and being a Jewish family was one of the only ones to survive, so managed to get out and got to France. And then she studied Russian at university. And my dad, who studied French and Russian at Oxford, um, at that time in the Cold War, if you studied Russian at any Western European university, when you went to Russia, you had to go and stay in one hotel in St. Petersburg. So it was a kind of, you, you could have made a great sort of American teen movie because it was full of like loads and loads of students all studying Russian from all around Western Europe. And on one corridor, my mum and my dad, I think one, my dad or my mum asked the other one for a bar of soap for the shower and the rest is history. So then my mum, you know, very romantic story meeting in St. Petersburg. And then my mum sort of came back, they dated and then they married. And then my mum moved to Oxford. She had me and my two sisters and she's done lots of different things. She's worked um, in computers. We lived in Scotland for a bit and that was at the birth of computing. She worked a bit in computing and um, then she became a teacher and now she runs a film festival in Scotland. Right. Nice. <laughs> I'm imagining you had quite a bookish upbringing then. Like you were surrounded by books and Yeah, lots arts. of books. Yeah, yeah. My dad, I think my dad was young when he had me and he was still right at the beginning of his career. And at that time, well, I think for all academics, when you're a, an academic starting out, you need to spend a lot of time writing your articles, getting in the journals, writing the books. So it's definitely the case that so in my dad's 20s, when I was young, he was most of the time in his study reading and writing. So as a role model, um, he wasn't particularly present, I didn't feel, in terms of the raising of me. But he was an amazing role model in terms of he's the guy surrounded by books who's writing books. And writing and learning is something that's really important. So I definitely feel that the house was what a, one devoted to learning and that was what's important. And the only way to get my dad's attention was to like do well at school, basically. Did the fact that he was like that make you resistant to that kind of life? I think that I never wanted to become an academic. Part of that might have been insecurity that I didn't think I was good enough. But also, for all the amount that I respected my dad for his academic career, I thought there's got to be more out there. And I was you know, couldn't wait to get out into the real world. I think my dad was probably slightly disappointed about why I didn't go into academia. So I think there is maybe a bit of attention there and now when um you know i'm a sort of insecure freelance writer i think well wouldn't it be nice to have a job in an institution that's been around for a thousand years <laughs> <laughs> what did you want to be when you were a boy then so if i met you like you know in your early teens and that what were you into and what 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 would you have said i want to be when i grow up sort of thing in my early teens i think i that's really it's a really good question i think I didn't want to be anything because I liked the idea that I didn't have to make my mind up. I kind of rebelled against this idea that, oh, the, you know, Jimmy wants to become an architect, Tommy wants to become a doctor. And I just wanted to get out there and see what there was. I was always really interested in 
journalism. And I think that's because I'm a gossip. I always wanted to know what was going on. I was like, love talking about what people were up to. And, you know, I founded the school magazine and I went to sixth form and I worked for the sixth magazine and I went to university and I worked for the newspapers. I've always been attracted to writing and finding out about the world and describing the world. It's always what I wanted to do. I never would have thought that I could have actually done that professionally because I didn't really, you know, I didn't know anyone who did that. But so I probably would have said, I don't know what I want to do, but did you hear about Mrs. Jones? (laughs) <laughs> what were you into? Like, were you into sport or music or dancing or, you know, what, what? Yeah, I was totally into music. So I was a uh, heavy metal was what I was really into. At age, age 12, I had a denim jacket with studs and like I knew how to write Led Zeppelin and, you know, the Zofo, whatever it is. So, so right. yeah, I was totally into that. And then I had this amazing change when I was about 16 and I became into like soul and I used to like the kind of Northern soul. And so I would like wear kind of jean dungarees and (laughs) the kind of big beret type thing. And maybe sometimes a kind of baseball jacket, the kind of slightly kind of Americana, you know, Motown, funk. Like I, I got into that. Yeah. I like music. I played electric guitar. So I like, that's what I like to do. Were you good at school? Yeah. So I was lucky that I was good at maths. And the thing about being good at maths is if you can do it, you can just do it. So you can do it and you don't really need to do very much work. So I always knew I was going to have loads of free time because the maths didn't take me any time at all, whereas other people were struggling. And I always knew that I was going to be near the top of the class because just the grades you get for your maths. If you do the maths, the physics and the chemistry is not that like difficult. Um, also because my mum was French, I spoke fluent French. So yeah, I was always, I was always quite good at school and I kind of, enjoyed it you know I had a dad who was a you know, at that time a university lecturer and I think what I remember about my school days is that I was always really small I was always a really short kid also I moved up like a year or maybe even two years so even in my own age range I was short but I was with kids who were one or two years older than me so I always had this kind of size I guess kind of insecurity so I became I don't know um like the nice guy, the friendly guy, you know, I, I think what I, I spent a lot of my time socialising and trying to, to be liked. That would inoculate you from being bullied a bit because you were small? Or... Yeah, because I, I think I just always, always felt, made me feel like a bit of an outsider. So I was really keen to be like an insider and someone who people would sort of embrace. And also, so I grew up, well, I was born in Oxford. Then when I was two, I moved to Edinburgh. And I was in Edinburgh for 10 years. And I had a thick Scottish accent. And then at age 12... I moved down south to live in Southampton, which I where I went to secondary school and then sixth form. And I can remember the first day that I went to my new school in England. I don't know what I was thinking. I wore a full Scotland national football kit tracksuit. <laughs> oh, no. It's like, like terrible. Obviously, that's like my identity as being this sort of Scottish kid. Yeah. So I was the Scot who was um, in England. I was the kind of short guy with all these like tall people. And also, I was good at maths, but I realised quite early on that back then, this is the late 70s, early 80s, maths, there was no geek cool. There was no nerd cool. If you were the good, sort of the nerdy people, it was uncool. It was, you know, I was also interested in girls. So if you wanted to be part of the gang that hung out with the people who liked music and there were girls in that gang. You had to make a real effort to do other things than just the maths. So I was always quite nerdy, but I was made an effort to be the person who was, you know, listening to the right music and like going to the right, hanging out with the cool kids, basically. As you came towards the end of high school then, what happened? What what were the decisions being made? Because eventually you've got to make decisions, don't you? Um, I think that so I went to the secondary school Uh, in Southampton and you're still young maybe you need to make a decision when you go to sixth form because the sixth form the way it was done then it was completely different to the school so for Americans what do we mean by sixth form so it's the last two years of compulsory education which is age 17 and 18 Hmm. and so this is an institution like the college that only has those two years and it was much more like a university than it was like a school like they didn't force you to go to lessons if you didn't want to go to lessons you didn't have to you could smoke if you wanted to there was no uniform or anything Um, so already Going to a sixth form takes kids from a much wider area. You're meeting people who are a bit more like you. And I had a good gang. One of them had a car. We would like go to nightclubs and experiment. I really enjoyed 
my childhood in Southampton. So Southampton, you know, talking to Americans, it is a city of maybe half a million people, 300,000 people. It's far enough from London for it to have its own energy, but it's quite kind of square, but it has it, it has good cinemas and it's got a theatre and it's got a university. So it's safe enough to experiment in loads of things and very not to be particularly dangerous. And it's also because it's a port city, it's very diverse culturally, that when I went to university, when I went to Oxford, all the kids who had grown up in London were just bored. They're like, London's much more interesting than this. Whereas I was kind of really excited because it was like going somewhere that was new and a bit different. What did you go and do at Oxford? I mean, and getting into Oxford's kind of a big deal, isn't it? Like, Yeah, I mean, I, I went to a state school, so I didn't go to private. It was paid by the government at free school. And one other person from my school, maybe two from the college, went there. So it was, yeah, it's really unusual. And it, it was tough. <laughs> but it, What did you do? Well, first of all, you obviously were getting good marks at school then. Like you, you yeah. talk about going out in your friends with a car and experimenting, but yeah. you're, you're obviously hitting your grades. With math, if you get it, you just get it. So I worked quite hard, but I also spent a lot of time socialising. And the only thing that I could get in to a good university was maths, because that was what I was good at. And I must have had quite a good intuitive sense of maths because to get into Oxford, you had to do an exam. And I did the exam and I don't know, 200, 300 people. No, it, must have, no, it must be several thousand people do it because I think they accept 200 people. And most of the people who go to private schools have special teachers that teach you to try and get this exam. It sounds like a kind of a humble brag, I believe is the term. Right. But I was like something like 30th or something. So I did really well at exam. That's basically the best I've ever done in an exam ever in my life. Mm. But because of that, Oxford were going to take me. Yeah. No matter what happened in any of, my, any of my other subjects. That's not a humble brag, by the way. That's just a brag. Well, it's a brag. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, well, you, I, you, the difference between a humble brag... I, I, I would have to sort of just drop it in the conversation without talking about you it. Would ha- would, no, you'd have to be more self-deprecating. So it would be something okay. like, oh, I'm, you know, oh, I'm <laughs> such a nerd. I'm so embarrassed. I came, you know, I, I was the 30th big... You'd say, I was the 30th biggest nerd in the whole country. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to be a mathematician at this point? So no, I don't want to be a mathematician. I want to go and study math and philosophy. And the reason why I'm attracted to math and philosophy is that I'm beginning to be interested in you know, philosophy, the ideas of where are we going in the world, and also reading kind of Bertrand Russell and reading beginning books on philosophy. So, think, so, so it sounds like you're interested in philosophy, but you're having to use maths as your way to get to the philosophy because you're so good at maths. Yeah, kind of, yeah. kind of. I mean, I, I was interested in maths. It's not so I wasn't, but it, it, um, it was just one thing I was interested in and there were other things that I was maybe more interested in. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you're at Oxford doing maths and philosophy. Yeah. And then how does that unfold? Where, what, what, what is unlocked here? What interests, you know, where does it lead? So lots of people want to go to Oxford because it's a brilliant university. I actually think my maths education was shockingly bad. And I would never recommend anyone going to Oxford, um, the college that I went to Oxford, to study maths. And I slightly regret the college that I went to. And that's because I got into this Corpus Christi College. It's a very small college. There was only one or two other people doing maths, and it meant there were only one or two tutors. So you had to do that tutor. And math, all of a sudden, it gets really difficult. And to understand it, you need to have a tutor who is like good at teaching. And you also need to have lots of other people who are studying it who are also struggling. And I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. And also, I was interested in the philosophical side. And the specialisms of my two tutors was not in that way at all. Mm. One of them was actually like kind of a graduate student who had no training in, or interest in being a teacher at all. And I was just baffled. So I was kind of really down and a bit depressed about it because I thought there are lots of these interesting things that I want to find out about. But I was finding it a bit too difficult. I love the philosophy and I ended up specialising in the philosophy of maths. Um, and also I was having like an amazing time socially. I um, joined the local paper. Of the, the, the university paper, and I edited called Charwell. I edited the university paper. I also, so this was, I was 17 when I went to Oxford. Um, so that was in 1988, or, no, 87. Once I'd edited the paper in the beginning of my second year, it was the summer of love. It was 1988, it was Acid House. So I started a nightclub. So for my next couple of years, I was running this nightclub. Um, it was so your nightclub? It was my nightclub, Club Automatic. Yeah. Club Automatic. I'm yeah. like, you are definitely the first nightclub <laughs> owner that has been on the number five well, podcast. I, mean, I didn't own the venue, right. but 
we put it on in several different venues. It was me and two friends. And I was the, one of the guys was the DJ. One of the guys like did the posters and one of the guys did like the money and like dealing with these guys. Yeah. And that was me. Club Automatic. You were the money man. Yeah, I was. I Wheeler was, and dealer. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah. What was that like? Was it good? Or did, was it like a fun or did it become stressful? Like, were you like, oh, every night's a party? Or was it like, oh, what have I done? This is so hard. It was amazingly fun. But the great thing about university is you get to sort of make all those mistakes early. I mean, it was kind of the first night we did. because we th- you know, Club we, Automatic we, opening night. <laughs> what we did, it was called Bliss was the opening night of Club Bliss. And we had these passports and which we made and distributed them around the university. And you had to bring your passports. And we say, hey, we had a stamp for each different night that you'd stamp in your passports. So you could see which one hmm. you'd, you'd been to. And like far too many people showed up. And so we got to the limit already and I was up by the door and then there was the guy who actually owned the place who had like kind of tattoos and this kind of guy Hmm. and he was like look we got to the limit but if you give me some extra money I'll let you put more people in (laughs) and at that time I'm like yeah Brit sounds great (laughs) sounds great I mean, just, it wasn't a particularly good night because when I tried to go downstairs, actually, I couldn't go downstairs because there was just like far too many people. It was packed. It was was far too packed. So you learn pretty, you know, you wouldn't do that. So if a fire broke out that night, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. (laughs) No, we probably wouldn't be in jail. (laughs) Yeah, or or, 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 or kind of, you know, trampled on and stoned by my peers. But the great thing about that was that I don't come from a a rich family, but I managed to fund everything from the, the nightclub. From club, from club, club Automatic. Club Automatic, you realise, is the podcast title now. I hope you realise that. <laughs> <laughs> you, the, you have no choice in this. <laughs> All right. So uh, after being a nightclub owner and, and a nightclub <laughs> owner by night, uh, philosopher of mathematics, expert by day, did you do well at university? Did you come out with a g- good degree? Mm, yeah, but, mm, not particularly. No. Um, I got 2-1. Yeah. So that's good. Which, that's which, just, which yeah. is okay. I mean, standard, solid. I'd always wanted to be what they call the alpha gamma candidate. So the alpha gamma candidate is the person who gets alphas, which is like the best, and gammas, which is like kind of the worst. So it's someone who's, that's interesting. Sometimes you're brilliant and sometimes you're terrible. This is, this is the idea that maybe even when you're terrible, you're actually kind of brilliant. An unrecognized genius. Exactly. What you don't want to be is the slightly boring humdrum beaters all the way. Right. And essentially all through university, I was just like beaters all the way. I'd work really hard to something get a beater and I wouldn't do much work still get a beater I was just like kind of regular and boring and then come my finals I kind of flunked some of the exams and got gammas but the essay or what's it called thesis that I wrote on the philosophy of maths I got an alpha so that kind of balanced it. So is that a humble brag or not? But that, that, that's, clo- <laughs> that's closer. Yeah, that's, cl- that's closer. Yeah, you're getting but, there. But but I love that and, and actually I wrote a letter to my the head of the philosophy of math saying i'm kind of surprised by well this is how i remember it having got done so well at, at this but i really enjoyed doing it and if it it's really good is there maybe a future for me carrying on in academia and being doing the philosophy of maths well, i never heard back what? so maybe did he even get a reply no he, he might not have got it there were no emails in those days so maybe you couldn't you knock on the door yeah but well you only hear the results and you know you're you're off you're gone. You know, you're gone. You're out of college. By this point, you must be thinking about like money and stuff. So, like, what are you thinking about a job? I'd realised at that time that is Club Automatic still running? No, it's not. No, okay. I still got the posters at home though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you, there's no Club Automatic income. So you need there's another no. income. Um, I began to realise how the English establishment network works. So I was in the group of people who did journalism, did newspapers. And I knew at the time that, you know, the person who was the editor of The Guardian then had edited Charwell. So I had been the editor of Charwell. Yeah. And I could just tell that if you're part of this group, you know the people who are like one year older than you, and they know the people who are one year older than them. Mm. And it's just part of a gang. And I realised without knowing it or consciously joining this gang, I was like, totally in this Oxford journalism gang. Mm. And one day in my final term, one, in fact, Alan Rusbridger, who became the editor of The Guardian, at that time he was features editor, I think, of The Guardian, was invited to Oxford to give a talk. And I was the person that said, oh, Alex, you, you're editor of Charwell. You go and meet him at the station. So I met Alan, who was a journalist at the time, not particularly well known, walked him to my college, he gave the talk, walked him back and kept in touch with him. And then, you know, a few weeks after I graduated, I just he called him and said, do you have any work experience? 
And he was like, yeah, sure. So within a few weeks of university, I was doing work experience at The Guardian, which was the only paper that I would have wanted to work for. And I've been linked to The Guardian ever since, the last 30 years. So you've started on a path of journalism and writing now, obviously. It's not just you go from Oxford to The Guardian. I remember asking Alan, I said, well, what should I do if I want to become a journalist? And he said, you need to go to work on a local paper. So I applied to dozens and dozens of local papers. And the paper that accepted me was the Brighton Evening Argus. So I left London. I moved to Brighton. Well, first they sent me to Hastings, where they had a training course. I lived in Hastings for six months, learning shorthand and local government and libel law. And then I moved to Brighton, where I worked for the Evening Argus for a couple of years. You know, it's an evening paper. It's really exciting. Brighton is a fantastic place. Lots of great nightclubs. Um, you weren't tempted to start one yourself? The competition was too fierce. Right. <laughs> but I definitely frequented many of them. <laughs> In fact, I was always jealous when I was at Oxford because I had a friend at Sussex University and he had a much, you know, it was much. It was always great fun coming to Brighton to visit him. Then after a couple of years of the Evening Argus, I moved to London, freelanced for a bit and finally got a job at, at The Guardian. Yeah, but by that time, you know, I always had an identity as a math, maths person. Like, I'd never met anyone else in journalism. None of my friends in journalism, none of my friends who were in university journalism or were national journalism had science degrees. Definitely not a maths degree. So I always felt it was kind of a bit weird. You know, I was this sort of fish out of water, the mathematician. And I wasn't researching maths or studying maths, but I definitely had a super mathematical way of understanding the world. And you could tell so clearly that people just didn't understand basic statistics, like how percentages worked, how probabilities worked. You know, you'd go to a demonstration and people would be like, Alex, how many people are here? Like, well, what you do is that you, you know, (laughs) count the number of people on the horizontal up this way and the number of people in that way, and then you multiply them together and then that gives you the estimate. People just don't understand. It's like basic maths. So I used to always think that the fact that I understood maths really gave me an advantage in a lot of simple news journalism. And also when it came to writing stories, I was never particularly good at writing. But when you come to write news reports, they have a structure and it's, it's like learning how to write a proof. You've got to have one thing that follows on from the next thing that follows on the next thing. And you've got to have a kind of a, a beginning and a conclusion. And you've got to summarise it in like the most efficient and concise way. So I quite enjoyed the fact that I had this mathematical brain amongst people who used words and it meant that I wasn't as fancy a writer. I was never going to be a kind of a columnist of uh, political opinions or anything like that. But also I had certain things that I could do that no one else could do. Did your mathematical inclinations affect what you were writing about editorially at this stage? Like, would you be pitching, pitching your editor on, do you know what, there's been a really big discovery at the Large Hadron Collider or there's been this proof in mathematics or were you doing regular news coverage? So at the local paper, I was doing totally regular news coverage. But I had my own interests. I can remember once the Polgar sisters, if you can remember them, they were the first great female chess players. They were sisters from Hungary and they were making an appearance somewhere in the Brighton area. And I was like, I want to interview them. I'm like totally, totally excited by speaking to the female chess player. And I went and I, I spoke to them and, and that was great. Whereas no one else in the paper could have cared, could have cared less. So I, I had that sort of interest. And when I went to the Guardian, I can remember that this was just right at the beginning of the internet, right at the beginning of emails. And I used to often be given those stories that required some kind of knowledge of how a computer might work. I mean, I can't code. or well, you called it programming back then, but I, I, can't, I couldn't do that. But I understood the language of it. And also, I think that what having training as a mathematician or as a scientist means is that you can call up people and you speak their language so you can ask them in language that they understand and they can tell it back to you in their own language and then you can translate that language clearly. So Translation after all this. It is, it is translate, I'm translating kind of geekery into simple English. And I think that often people say, well, isn't writing really difficult? Well, it sort of is, but actually writing is about making things simple. And if you can't write a simple sentence, you can't communicate. Okay, so we've got we've placed you at the Guardian at this stage. Give us a short, a bit more short history before we get to some books. Like you, you end up in Brazil at some point, don't you? Because I was at university age seventeen, and then I started work within days of graduating. I always made a promise to myself when I'm twenty eight, in, in the distant future, <laughs> when I'm twenty eight. Why twenty eight? I don't know. I just that was the day when I'm twenty eight. Hmm. I'm going to stop everything and take a year out. So I'd got myself this great job at the Guardian, and I was like. So I was in the news pool, but also writing features. 
And as the youngest reporter for a while on The Guardian, which meant that this was when the Spice Girls and Oasis. So I was kind of writing about all this great kind of culture. And it was really, it felt that I was almost kind of part of it because I was writing about it for the paper that has the greatest amount of youth readers. And I was like, my God, at six months to the date that I promised myself to stop everything. And I thought, it's a brave thing to do. Don't give up something else when it's going badly. Give something up when it's going well. That gives you, it feels that it's incredibly empowering because things are going well, you feel you're in control of your life, then to really take control of your life. And so I went to the um, editor and said, I want to take a year off. Can you give me a year sabbatical? This is Alan Rosbridge at the time. And he said, that sounds like a great idea, but I can't give you a year off. So you'd have to lose your job and like you might get it again, but... Who knows? And I was like, oh, that's not a very good vote of confidence. <laughs> I, 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 I had that exact same conversation when I left my newspaper. Can really? I, can I have a year off? No, but good luck. It's a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of the best thing I ever did. Mm. So I said, well, I'm going to resign. And then I thought, OK, I want to go and live abroad. And I wanted to live somewhere where, um, so this is rule one, I could learn the language to a fluent level in a year. So that eliminated languages with different alphabets or scripts. I didn't want to go to Japan or China because I thought I wouldn't be able to learn that, that language probably a year. I already spoke French and I'd done A-level German, so I spoke German okay. Um, so I thought Spanish, Portuguese, South America sounds really interesting. And a friend of mine had just come back from like a week in Rio and he was like, oh my God, it's amazing. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to Brazil. And the other thing I realised was that I didn't have much money. I had enough money probably to live like really skin for a year but not to live particularly well so I thought let's go somewhere and try and live cheaply but if I need to earn money I need to be able to what can I do I'm a journalist I need to be able to write stories so where is the place in the world that has the most amount of stories for the smallest amount of journalists who were there and at that time so this was 1998 there's a handful of journalists in Brazil almost no journalists in Brazil and the reason why Brazil had until a few years before that been a dictatorship and so the only stories that you ever heard about Brazil were deforestation of the Amazon, the workers' movement, um, massacre of street children. It was very much this kind of anti-dictatorship, human rights issues, which very important, but tended to attract the kind of campaigning sort of journalists writing about inequalities, which you want to hear about them, but gives you such a, a one-note idea about what the country is like. There was no one writing about Brazilian music or uh, Brazilian architecture, or even the Brazilian economy. It was all these kind of quite depressing social issues. So I thought, well, that, there are obviously these great stories out there, but no one's writing them. And Brazil has the other problem that where do you base yourself as a journalist? Sao Paulo, Rio, or Brasilia? So they're all sort of kind of spread. Um, anyway, so I made the decision to go to Rio just because I thought... Big country, not many journalists there, and my mate had just come back from spending a week in Rio. And it was fantastic. I was there for five years. Five years? Yeah. And what kind of journalist were you in that time? Were you writing about Brazilian architecture? And Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. I met Brazilian architects. I met Oscar Niemeyer, who's the guy who, he's dead now, but he um, built or designed Brasilia. It's an amazing kind of modernist city of kind of concrete with all the kind of curves made out of concrete. I know Brazil probably better than any country in the world. I mean, it's it's massive. It's almost as big as the continental United States. Um, it goes from the different climates and ecosystems very hugely. I would spend every month in Rio, I would spend a week somewhere else. So I traveled really, really widely. Hmm. And I wrote everything. You know, I was the, I was actually the South America correspondent. I became the South America correspondent of The Guardian because when I got there, I started writing stories and they're like, okay, Alex, you win. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take you back. Right. And so, yeah, I went to Chile to do stuff on Pinochet. I went to Argentina to do stuff on the Falklands. I went to Venezuela to do stuff on Chavez. Um, I went down the Amazon in a small boat to meet uncontacted Indians. I did, I did all this like amazing, amazing stuff. And two years into that, a publisher approached me and said, do you want to write a book on Brazilian football? And like, I like football, but I'm not a sports journalist. And my initial response was, no, eh, not really. Like football? Ask a sports journalist. Because I thought what they were asking was a book that tells you, you know, the size of Pele's shoe. Yeah. You know, and stuff like that. But they said, no, 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 we don't want a sports journalists to do it. We want something more kind of about the culture of Brazilian football. And then I thought, do you know what? All the things that interest me in Brazil, and a lot of it was, you know, 
I'd gone to Brazil. I didn't know anyone there. I had to discover who I was, essentially. It's by me searching for my own identity. And Brazil is such a young country that it's still searching for its own identity. So I guess I was really interested in, like, identity and culture and, like, who you are. And I realised that football, which, like me, had come from Europe to Brazil um, and totally changed. I mean, I didn't change Brazil, but football totally changed Brazil. So much so that football is the greatest symbol of Brazilianness. What a great way to tell the story of Brazil through football. Mm -hmm. So my book on Brazilian football, which I then accepted to write, is essentially about the anthropology and and history and architecture and music, about all, all these things, just kind of telling stories that through the lens of football, you tell the story of a nation. Had you ever written a book at that point or was no. that, that was your first book? My first book. And I was on my own. and I vowed never to write a book after that because it took about 18 months and I worked on it every day. And writing books... It's it's hard, even if you can do it. And I think at that, at that time, I had you don't know whether you can do it. Brazil is such a big country that there's always more you can do, and there's where do you where do you stop? Why did you leave after five years? I needed to know whether I was going to be in Brazil forever or whether it's a temporary thing. And I thought if it's going to be a temporary thing, five years is enough. And also, I just I'd started to dislike the people who live in Rio, the Cariocas. I wouldn't say all Brazilians. Rio is a very difficult place to live as a foreigner if you're going to unless you totally become cariaca it's a place where there's not no great intellectual culture people don't really read the newspapers they're not really bothered about the rest of the world they're obsessed about body image and how rio is brilliant and amazing and i realized that all the friends that i was making there weren't from rio they're brazilians but not from rio i started to get really frustrated with the way just just the way life was okay i mean it's beautiful and the climate is amazing and the food is amazing and it's kind of paradise but i was just becoming grouchy and grumpy and i just thought you know what it's time to go if i'm going to be grouchy and grumpy i'm I'm, I'm going to do that in england yeah and i I think that it was part of going away and it's it's good to go and sort of you know say you are don't sort of explore the world but then you sort of think it's time to come home all right then so let's talk about how you've become who you are now so you, you've come home what what now does the guardian take you back no so i came back hoping that they might and there was nothing there for me but also before i went to brazil i was writing about you know parochial british matters and i went to brazil and i was writing about very important matters that affected the whole continent i came back and i just didn't want to do i could have really campaigned to have my old job back but i still sort of didn't really want it i'd sort of done it i wanted to move on to do something else and i still I'd left Brazil, but a lot of me was still, a lot of my friends and a lot of my heart was still in Brazil. So for the next few years, I tried to write about Brazil. At one time, I tried to, um, so I could have made it being a millionaire. Hmm. I came back saying, guys, there's this amazing fruit that is really big in Brazil that you can't get anywhere. It's not Brazil. It's called acai. How about I start importing acai? Uh I found one guy, Ronan. His company is called Sublime Acai, Sublime Foods. Uh And I met him when he was just starting it because he'd had a family member who went to Brazil who told him about it and he was it was like he was like a few months maybe a year ahead of me he was doing it and I was just thinking yeah maybe I could do this and then I never did and now acai is just like mega everywhere it's just absolutely everywhere no. yeah I can't I don't know if I've had it I can't think what it is but oh it's lovely oh, mm-hmm. I love it. I still order it from Ronan I've always I've mm. always got it in my freezer you mix it in with banana and pulp that's delicious nice Tell me how you become a book writer, because that's what you are now. Yeah. So w- what happened, I was completely failing to do anything, getting bored of writing about Brazil, not being in Brazil, failing to import acai. And then someone came to me, in fact, a friend who's an agent, who then became my agent, who said, Alex, you are a writer. Your book on Brazil did really well, but you understand about maths. That's what you need to be doing. And I was like, yeah, maths. I gave that up like a decade ago. And she's like, no, no, think about it. Go write a proposal because the way things work in terms of writing a book for kind of professionals who have already written a book is that you get yourself an agent and with an agent you work on a proposal about what that book's going to be and maybe the proposal is just a sheet of paper normally it would be about say four or five sheets of paper if you've never written before you might need to have write a chapter or two so that's like 30 40 sheets of paper just to prove you've got a bit of stickability and you can write yeah just just to prove you can write so what i wrote is like an outline and saying look at my previous work you can see i can write Whereas if you couldn't do that, you'd, you'd have to. Get, no one would take a chance if you didn't see any of your writing. Yeah. And then you give it to a publisher, and the publisher decides whether they want to or not. And then they will give you a contract, and the contract will be for a certain amount of money, and you get normally a quarter of that money 
on signing of the contract, the next quarter when you finish the manuscript, the next quarter when the hardback comes out, and the next quarter when the paperback comes out. Right. That's roughly how it works. So this is my friend. She said, I know there's an interest in maths, in people who can write to write about maths. I just know this. So write me a proposal for a math book. And She I, felt the time was ripe for this, did she? Or? Yeah, and she'd had a conversation with someone who was an editor, and the editor was moaning, oh, I've got my five-year-old kids just started school, and I can't even do their maths homework. And so my agent friend was like, aha, this is a woman who I need to pitch. Nah. This is the book that's going to explain maths to parents. In fact, the book that Rob Easteray wrote, Maths for Mums and Dads, was ultimately the book that this editor person did publish okay so it's a, it's a kind of small world yeah i went back and i thought okay i'll try and write a proposal so i went and read loads of sort of maths books popular maths books and i can remember being so bored reading them and just often lying on my sofa and falling asleep in the afternoon reading them what do you think their weakness was bad writing bad writing bad writing maybe i was not the audience for it maybe yeah a lot of them were just just boring just boring. And I, I, I can remember thinking you could do a really good kind of movie shot of me depressed, walking down thinking it's just boring. It's all rubbish. It's all boring. And then thinking, oh, wow, this is the breakthrough. Maths is not boring. So the fact that the books that I've read are a bit boring means that there's room for a not boring one. Right. So I was like, brilliant. And I got really excited. And I was like, this is the book that is going to make maths exciting and interesting. And so I wrote the proposal and it was originally going to be called The Book of Numbers. And it ultimately turned into Alex's Adventures in Numberland. And what I tried to do there is to make maths as fun and exciting and as interesting as I could for the non-maths audience. Mm. I realised that the Brazilian book that I wrote was the best per possible training to write Alex's Adventures in Numberland. What I did with the Brazilian book is I spent a year going all around Brazil, interviewing people in Portuguese, synthesising in my head and writing a book for people who've never been to Brazil about what Brazil is like. I did exactly the same thing for Numberland. I was like the foreign correspondent in the world of numbers. I went around the world. So I went to India, I went to Japan, I went all across America, I went to Europe, interviewing people whose lives connected to maths in some way, kind of mathsy people, and I came back home, synthesised everything and wrote it in information that someone who doesn't like maths would be interested in. So when I'm writing, I always have imagined me sitting at a bar, talking to my friend, usually it's my friend Bridget, who's not interested in maths, and it's me just saying a sentence or a fact, and I imagine how she would respond to that fact. So I was always thinking about the non-mathematician, and so I wrote this book thinking, this is a book that's going to open up the wonders of maths to non-maths audience. So I wrote it, and inevitably the first people who get sent a book on maths and not the non-maths audience. It goes to all the maths writers. Didn't go to Bridget. <laughs> it didn't go, didn't go to Bridget. Although she has bought several copies. <laughs> um, and the reviews started coming in of like you know, positive reviews. And even and I realized that actually the people who were reading it was kind of the maths audience. Because the maths audience were also really happy to read about maths things. That was written in a yeah. in a slightly different in a journalistic way. You know, I'm I'm not reinventing the wheel. The material in my books is very similar materials you'll find in loads and loads of other books. But I think I'm the only person writing maths. You know, who's done time as a foreign correspondent and as a local rep cub reporter on an evening paper. So I know how to I know, I know how to hook you in. Hmm. I know how to to tell a story. I know I know about structure, and I've got an eye, I've got an eye for a good story. And I think that you might have aced your probability paper at GCSE or A-level or even at university. But even so, you're going to be interested in the life of the man who lives in Reno, Nevada, who sets the odds to more than half of the world's slot machines. Hmm. The probability involved is not complicated, but you get to see it through this man's life, how it applies in the world through a personal story. I think the trick in math writing is to appeal to the Bridgets of the world, but also to the people who know the maths. And the way that you do that is that you've got to take the maths slow enough that the Bridgets understand. So you've got to provide more than the maths. So the people who understand the maths are, are going to stick with you and not just think this is boring. And the way that you do that is that you bring interesting people in it. Because it's always interesting learning about people. Were there ever any times during your travels around India and Japan and all the places you went where you began to doubt like you began to think 
is this good enough? Is this actually going to make a book? Or was it the opposite? Was it, oh my goodness, I can't believe how much stuff is here. This is going to be the greatest book ever written. Well, I never thought it would be the greatest book ever written, which it obviously is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for putting that there. No. You can't use <laughs> that. <laughs> you can't use that on the cover of your book. Oh, yeah. I didn't say it in that context. <laughs> no, I, before you write a book, you have absolutely no idea how people are going to respond to it absolutely no idea and it's kind of terrifying because by writing a book i mean it's kind of not for the faint-hearted and like i do even now like lose sleep about how a book is going to be received you put all your emotion all your energy you really believe in something and once it's out there people can criticize it as much as they like and and, and, and they often do and you've got to have quite a thick skin not to be not, not not to be hurt by that. And also I think often readers think, just by the fact that he's come out with a book, he's, he, he deserves that criticism. Often like we like talk about celebrities on the telly, we just kind of criticise them. Actually, when writing, writing a book, you know, <laughs> I guess you could be, need to be philosophical about it. You just got to take it. People are going to, you know. Is there one that sticks in your head? Is there a review or something someone once said that like still punches you in the gut to this day? Um there are a few things that people have said that it's a bit, there is a bit too arcane to mention the actual lines that, that I've been like, oh, you don't understand you, the power you have in that review. You know, I've spent a couple of years writing a book. It's 300 pages long. There's one line that you've chosen to base your review on, which is something that you don't believe yourself. But actually, if you bothered to look in the um, notes at the back that I kind of you know argue against that position, and so what you're saying is there is actually there that that makes me kind of angry, and I think that often young, oh, fuck God, I, I was young once. Um, I think that sometimes the mark of a bad reviewer, and often happens maybe the first couple of times you review a book, you're desperate to just kind of criticise it to show that kind of you're you, clever, you can, yeah, um, exactly. And sometimes I think that if you don't like a book, don't review it. That's my, my thing. And unless someone, it's so kind of outrageous and someone's trying to be someone that they're not. But most books, people put such a lot of effort, such a lot of love and such a lot of passion into it. And if it's not your thing, then it's not your thing. It might be someone else's thing. But can't reviewers sometimes warn people off a book that might be a waste of their time? Like, isn't that kind of one of the services of a review as well? Yeah, probably the best thing to do is just not to review it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've not, especially now where it's so difficult. It's so difficult for writers to make a living. Writing a book about mathematics. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I feel like I have the luxury of making videos about mathematics where we can get out a piece of brown paper and a pen or we can draw a yeah. diagram and I can use animations. I mean, I know you do use pictures and diagrams in your books, but do you think writing about mathematics presents extra challenges because of the the lack of visuals or the lack of being able to see things unfold on the page yeah writing about abstract things is very difficult but there's several things that make maths very difficult to write about one is the idea of how fast you go through the maths because you don't want to lose the people who are slower than the people who get it but you don't want to lose the people who get it really fast for thinking this is really boring so judging that is difficult the other thing is often in maths you need to be incredibly clear what you're talking about you know you could be and i get this all the time when I'm writing puzzles that you you want the puzzle to be nice and short, like one line, such and such is happening, what's the solution? And inevitably you get people say, oh, but what about zero people? And then you're like, it's obvious, it's self-evident. I could have done a, I could have done a whole page of clarification saying, okay, it's not zero people, the people aren't aliens, the people that are just like normal people by which we understand. Oh, yeah. I you can know, imagine because... I- I mean, we probably won't talk as much as I'd like to about your puzzle writing, but writing yeah. a puzzle, I think, must be a nightmare for that. Because one thing I've learned on the internet is if there is a way for something to be misunderstood, it will be misunderstood. It's totally. So you, you need to have the confidence of, you need to write incredibly clearly, but totally unambiguously. And that's actually quite difficult. Because if you were to say it totally unambiguously, you would have an five pages for, for each sentence. So you need to yeah. work out what you don't include. Yeah. And it's true that often people who like puzzle books or like puzzles or like math are, you know, I, I count myself maybe among them, are super pedantic people. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just that's the sort of person. Yeah, if you write a puzzle about people eating bananas, there'll always be people going, what if I don't like bananas or something? It's like... Ah. Exactly. So I've got this puzzle column in The Guardian and I find the puzzles, write the puzzles, 
do the headlines, and no one really checks it. For a while, I was trying to ask other mathematicians to check it, but then it's just too time consuming, and also who checks the checkers, etc. Mm. And what I've realized that there are lots of people who every week say, not another badly phrased problem by Alex Bells. Right. Um, you know, the problem with Alex Bells is some of the nice puzzles, but he just phrases them really badly. To make write a good puzzle, it's like you need to stress test it with 50,000 people reading it, because there's always going to be a few people who spot something that no one else has spotted. And yeah. sometimes the only way you get that is by putting it in a column mm. about the, these people. So what I slightly resent this kind of negativity of, eh, but what about, you know, people don't like bananas? It's actually kind of quite good because it means that, wow, now I know the perfect way to phrase that puzzle. Yeah. Can we skip a few of your books? Or Let's do. Because we are running out of time. In the notes for this, I'm going to have a link to you can go and look at all Alex's books and there's loads of them um, and they're all fantastic. But I want to talk about your most recent book because if I don't, <laughs> you'll be really upset and, yeah, and angry at me. <laughs> <laughs> and, but also I think it's good because I feel like your latest book kind of really does bring the, the wheel full circle because we talked at the start of the podcast about how your parents are both, you know, in language and translation and things like yeah. that. And your latest book seems to merge it all together really nicely. So go on then. Yeah, it, it totally does. So I come from a family where we speak several different languages. My mum speaks Hungarian and French and Russian, and my dad speaks Russian and French and German, English. And I studied, well, I could speak French. But I speak Portuguese from being in Brazil, which I also spoke a bit of German. And so I've written a book called The Language Lover's Puzzle Book, which is a book of puzzles about language and languages. So in that sense, it does bring me back to... A house full of languages, but don't be deceived by the title. This is actually a book for mathsy people. Right. It's almost all the puzzles are code breaking puzzles. It's just that rather than that code being something invented by a computer or something invented to show some mathematical idea, the code is a language. So a lot of the puzzles are I give a few words or maybe a piece of text in one language maybe with a translation, and then you've got a few other words, and then you have to deduce what that might mean. Um, I've got a puzzle, say, on Egyptian hieroglyphics. So probably the greatest decipherment in history was the decipherment of hieroglyphics by Champollion in the 19th century. And he did that by using the Rosetta Stone and then the Philae Obelisk. Both of them are bilingual ancient Greek hieroglyphics. When he knew that he'd made that decipherment, it was because he could use the information in one to deduce something about what the other one said. So I have a puzzle which shows you something from the Rosetta Stone, and I say, this is what means the Rosetta Stone, and you need to use that. Then I show you something from the file of this, and you need to work out what that one is. So you're actually replicating the original decipherment of Champollion. And that is a it's language because it's, you know, hieroglyphics, you know, ancient languages. It's, it's so kind of romantic, this idea of trying to do that. But it's purely mathematical puzzle. You need to look at the patterns and it's pattern recognition and then a bit of insight and then working out how you can apply that knowledge. Hmm. And I talk about ancient languages, modern languages. I talk about invented languages. I talk about scientific languages. You talk about numbers in other languages too. I, I talk about... There are some languages that have brilliant words for numbers. Chinese, Japanese. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10, 1, 10, 2, 10, 3, 10, 4, to 2, 10. 2, 10, 1, 2, 10, that's really, really simple. So and that, systematic and logical. And... Yeah, and it means that children find learning numbers much easier than they do in a country like ours, where you go 10, 11, 12, 13. Like, what's that about? Mm. 20, rather than... Doesn't really work. Well, French is even worse. You've got 80, um, 480s. No, 80, which is 420s. But of the European languages, the one that certainly has the most weird, unfathomably bizarre system of counting from 1 to 100 has got to be Danish. And there's a fantastic puzzle in the Language Lover's Puzzle Book. Okay. That what I do is that I what give you... What was that you... called? Was it the Language Lover's Puzzle Book, you say? I think it was called the Language Lover's Puzzle Book. <laughs> by by like, Alex Bellos. <laughs> it's true. Lexical perplexities and cracking conundrums okay. from across the globe. All right. Uh, you can read really that. All right. Um, <laughs> and... What I do is that I give you a bunch of words in Danish and say, well, those represent these numbers. And then I give you a few other words in Danish and you need to work out what those numbers are. And you will realize that the word for 50 in Danish doesn't have the root of the word for five in it anywhere, but has a root of half and of three. Right. Half and of three. And it uses that to build 50 somehow. Yes, it beats 50. Okay, well... 
I'm sure our Danish listeners are thinking that was the easiest puzzle you've ever set. Do you want to know the answer? But <laughs> Go on. Well, so essentially, it's a vigesimal system, so it counts in their 20s. And 50 is basically half three because it's halfway to the third score. So it's halfway between 40, which is the second score, and 60, which is the third score. Right. So it's, it's like half, I think it's called half treads. Really complicated for people learning Danish. The Danish government once tried to change it to the equivalent of 50 with the word for five in it and put it on their banknotes. But it's like no one ever used that word. Because right. once it's kind of ingrained, it's complicated, but you just, you just get used to it. And there are lots of other languages. I've got puzzles about yeah. the number systems of so Papua New Guinea is unique linguistically around the world because it's the most linguistically diverse place in the world. It has something like um, five, six hundred um, languages for quite a small population. It also is the only place where the number systems are often body tally systems. So apart from Papua New Guinea, you get bases of five, bases of 10, bases of 20. That's because we've got five fingers on a hand, 10 both hands and 20 with fingers and toes. You get things like base 14, Base 28. In Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, because what they're doing is that they count pinky. So one, then your five fingers. Then I might go wrist, elbow, oh, elbow, shoulder, nipple, chin, nose. Okay. And then you get your, and, 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 that, and that's how you do it. So rather than just counting on fingers like we will, they'll count on all sorts of protuberances. Yes, they do. And yeah. some even on, you know, penis and testicles. Really? Yeah, they do. They do. What number are those ones? <laughs> So let me ask you a final question then. I'll, there'll be a links to the books in the in the notes for this podcast, and I'm not going to recommend the book <laughs> because I haven't read it yet. But if it's any, but if your past books are anything to go by, I'm sure it's really good. But let me ask you this: of all, because you've written numerous books now, yeah, you, you mentioned towards the start that you thought maybe your father had deep down had wished you'd gone into academia and things like that. Of all the books you've written, how do you think this one will rank in his standings? Because now you're 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 veering into his wheelhouse now. Well, it's very interesting to say that this is the first time that I have kind of stepped onto his patch. And has, has he read? Has he read it? Yeah, he's he's got a copy. But interestingly, we've had less discussion about this book than any of the others. So <laughs> what, yeah, what do I read into that? <laughs> but the thing is, he, hang on. If he's not reviewing it, does that mean he doesn't like it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's a book of puzzles hmm. within language, hmm. and I think that. Also, I think that it is language, but you need to have a mathsy brain to solve these puzzles. Right. So I think he would struggle. I think he does struggle with actually doing the puzzles, even though he might know about the language is concerned. You know, there's a puzzle in there, which is, it's a cross number where all the clues and all the numbers are in Malagasy. Okay. So you might be brilliant at, well, actually, if you know, that, 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 that's a bad example, but um, you still need to understand about how crosswords or cross numbers and like logical deduction, Sudoku. You know, if you're good at crosswords, you're good at Sudoku. This is the book for you. Okay. Well, I'm getting into my crosswords at the moment. So maybe this is the book for me. This is a good book for a pandemic, isn't it? It's perfect because it will take you, you know, as the evenings draw cold, well, not in Australia, they get warmer. Yeah. <laughs> if you stay in, which is doing puzzles. Puzzles are, I spent the last five years essentially writing puzzles in the newspaper and puzzle books. And what's wonderful about puzzle books is that, well, firstly, they're entertaining, they're fun, they're sort of satisfying, but they're a way of learning something interesting. So I'm only interested in puzzles that at the end of it, you think, wow, I never knew that. So it's a way of getting this kind of thrill of discovering something new, but with the pleasure of having worked it out for yourself. So it's kind of this like uh, amazing thing rather than, you know, you could read a book about something, but you might get bored, but if you, it wouldn't sink in. But if you're actually having to try and work it out by yourself, you know, working out, well, why did the Babylonians write numbers like that? Why did, you know, why is Esperanto like that. It's much more satisfying, I think, to not be told, but to work it out for yourself. And I think that's what a good puzzle does really, really well. It gives you a bit of fun, but also you learn something by yourself. Thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Thank you. I want to see one of those club automatic posters as well. Oh uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you them. All right. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Well, that's all for today. Links to Alex's books and other work can be found in the notes for this episode. Please do go and have a look. Our thanks to the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute for supporting this podcast. I'm Brady Harron, and I'll be back soon with another episode. You can also check out hundreds of number file videos on YouTube, of course, and support our work yourself by going to patreon.com slash numberphile.